Welcome to the 2020 Singapore Literature Festival in New York City. My name is G. Leon Ko, and I'm the founder and organizer of Singapore Unbound and your host tonight. I'm wearing a midnight blue shirt and sitting in my home office in Harlem with a shelf of books behind me. My preferred pronouns are he, him. Organized by the New York City-based literary nonprofit Singapore Unbound, the Singapore Literature Festival brings together Singaporean and American authors and audiences for readings and discussions. Appropriately, the festival theme this year is the politics of hope. We acknowledge gratefully the sponsorship of Ethos Books and many private champions, as well as the support of our co-presenters, New Narrative, The Evergreen Review, Asia Society, Adelphi University's MFA program and soapbox series, NYU English Department's Post-Colonial Race and Diaspora Studies Colloquium, the Southeast Asian Studies program at the University of California, Riverside, and Books Actually. Tonight, we will hear from two terrific authors on the political possibilities of the short story, Nuralia Narasit, and Rico Shesoko. After their readings, they will field questions from the audience. Our co-presenter for this event is the Southeast Asian Studies Program at the University of California, Riverside. Let me first introduce you to our event moderator, Ines Tan. Ines Tan is the author of This Is Where I Won't Be Alone, a national bestseller in Singapore. A recent Kundiman Fellow, she holds an MFA in Fiction from the University of Michigan and an MFA in Poetry at the University of California, Irvine, where she teaches creative writing. Please welcome Ines. Before I go, I'll ask all our speakers to speak slowly and clearly so that a closed captioner can capture what you say. Thank you. Over to you, Ines. Alrighty, thank you, G. Hi, everyone. My name is Inez Tan. I am wearing a light blue shirt. My preferred pronouns are she, her, and I'm sitting in my room against a very blank wall. <laughs> it's a wonderful time to be with all of you, joining from so many places. We are thrilled to be hearing from Nuralia and Rico, and I would just like to start off by introducing them. Um, we'll have them then read from their short stories, and then we would be thrilled to take questions from all of you. So hold on to your questions, put them in the chat. We're really looking forward to having our great authors answer them today. Alrighty, first to read is Nuralia Nurasid. Nuralia is a writer and researcher. Her writing has been published in a variety of publications, including Quarterly Literary Review Singapore and Barumpuan Muslim Women in Singapore Speak Out. Her debut novel, The Gatekeeper, won the Epigram Books Fiction Prize. And in 2018, she was named the most promising Asian woman writer by Indiasi Magazine. Following Nuralia, we will have Rico Shisoko. Rico is a writer, an educator, and activist based in San Francisco. He has received fellowships from the Center for Fiction, Lambda Literary, and the National Endowment for the Humanities. Rico is the author of The Foley Artist, a collection of stories published by Gaudi Boy. He is a board member of Kuniman, a national literary organization dedicated to Asian American literature. So welcome, Noralia and Rico. We are thrilled to have you joining us. And we will be hearing from Nuralia first. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Noralia Nurasi, and I'm wearing a red shirt and sitting in the dining area of my living room in Singapore. However, due to privacy issues, I have to have a virtual background. Um, my preferred pronouns are she, her. Um, first, to give an introduction to the short story that I'll be reading. Okay, the short story that I'm reading is one that I have written sometime in 2010 for a class assignment on literature and photography. We, um, in that class, we were studying photographs and essays on the tenement housing situation during the Victorian era, 
where those of low income um, in society lives during that time. It got me thinking, and as we were, and as I was like going through the assignments for the assignment writing, going through the writing the assignment for, for that class, it got me thinking about the way those from low income households are represented in mainstream uh, media in Singapore, especially when done so against the backdrop of their own homes. Uh, the nature of presentation of the low income in Singapore is often to show their state of poverty, how their lives contrast against our own normal conditions. So we would often see the home space is crowded, often with many things, possessions, appliances, furniture, cramped into a small space. Um, we also often see the whole family and if there are many children in the household, we can bet that they will try to show the whole family. Often the family will be sitting on the floor. Um, at the time when I was doing the research for, for, the, uh, for the short story. However, we don't see the work that goes into making that space, no matter how non-ideal livable, and in this case, presentable for the public eye. So, uh, for Madam Jamila, the main character of my story, dignity is in making sure her home has been tidied up before the interview um, and that her children are well dressed. So I will be reading two parts from my short story, Madam Jamila's Family Portrait. One from the perspective of the newspaper photographer and one from the main character's perspective. Um, and I have a cat. She decides to make appearances once in a while. Right? So here's my short story. So part two, okay, positioning. When they came to the end of the interview, the photographer asked, can we have a photograph of all of you? Madam Jamila looks at the reporter who is scribbling Azman's remark very quickly in a small notebook. And then over her shoulder, at her children. She knows that Azman does not like to be photographed. Although some of her younger siblings are not shy, some of his younger siblings are not shy. She asks him and Ashira, take photo, you want? And they respond with reluctant waggles of their heads, uh, reluctant waggles of their heads. Suryani and Ferdows, her 10 and eight year olds only grin looking at their mother and then at the photographer. She peers down at Nabila and with a nudge to the girl's arm, she asks with a playful and childlike lip, lilt to her voice, you want? Nabila chews on her fingernail. She has been sitting in Madam Jamila's lap throughout the interview, her eyes darting from the reporter to the photographer never lingering on one for a long time. Now she looks at the photographer. Her answer to Madam Jamila's question is a shrug. Her fingers curved into her mouth. Madam Jamila nudges the girl's hand away and looks back up at the photographer. Can she replies with a cheerful nod. How you want to take? The man glances around the, around the room thinking how best to portray this impossible family of seven. That is, the impossible family of seven with a daughter not yet home. He would have loved to have the entire retinue of children there because it will make the picture complete. But right then, he must make do with what he has. He looks to the reporter for suggestions and all she can give him is that a picture in the living room will be sufficient. So he turns back to the family. The elder two of the children are still attentive, watching him from where they sit, quiet unless they are directly spoken to. During the interview, Madam Jamila will sometimes look back at them and ask them things as if to affirm what she has said and their answers will always be nods, never elaboration. The photographer can sense the self-consciousness they must feel at the idea of being photographed for the paper. It is not too difficult to imagine if one has been through that trying age 
that how they appear to their peers matter acutely to them. It is at this age that most children, or children they are to him who is himself 32 years old, are still not matured enough to know that they are those who can't afford the things most teenagers can. He remembers the carefree attitude, meticulously worn to mask the realization that life is not either all peachy or filled with teenage angst, and the knowledge that for some families, pain and suffering is real. Suryani and Firdaus, eight, 10 and eight years old respectively, look at him every now and then, but take a greater interest in their own games. They would burst into laughter before casting a glance at the strangers and hush themselves, at least until the next idea for a game crossed their minds. He wonders how he can then show these children for who and what they are. He decides to keep the children in the background, doing what they had been doing prior to this moment. As it is, Madam Jamila is already seated on the floor. She will be the centerpiece. She will, he will keep the little one in Madam Jamila's lap and Madam Jamila herself in sharp focus by contrast. There is something honest about the child, Nabila, dressed in a frock that looks like she, it must have been beautiful once, now faded and much too small for her. She has not taken her eyes off him since the interview began, remaining slumped against her mother's body. Her face, framed by a shock of curls. He smiles and tells her not to worry, I'll make you look chante, as he gives her a thumbs up. But she does not smile back. He takes up his camera and raises the viewfinder to his eye, framing them through it. He adjusts until he gets the composition right. He understands that he will have to take a few pictures from a few different angles, but he, will, he still hopes to get that one photo, the one photo that will be this family. Part three, snapshot. Madam Jamila watches the man ready his camera. It looks big con considering how thin and small cameras are becoming these days. And many of them integrated into mobile phones. Cameras are not uncommon, though no one in her family owns one. However, this camera about to take her family's portrait is frighteningly large with this protruding thing, the flesh cube, she suddenly remembers from which the flesh will come. She is seated on the plain tile floor of the living room of a three room flat. Her youngest daughter, Nabila, squirming in her lap. The rest of her children are either in various seats around the room or on the floor arranged such that they will be in frame when the photograph is finally taken. All her children, save for her 12-year-old daughter, all her children, save for her 12-year-old daughter. The girl is right then attending an English supplementary class in school. The primary school leaving examinations is near. She needs to study to get to a good secondary school. The small television where it sits on the equally diminutive table is tuned to the local news, to the local evening arts channel. Azman and Ashira are not watching the show, the channel is playing. They are looking at the man and his camera, perhaps wondering what is going to happen next. The children have homework to do, but the people from the newspapers have come all the way to their home to interview their mother and take pictures of them. Their first family portrait sends one sister and the father they do not like to remember. Madam Jamila lifts her hand and tucks a strand of hair behind her ear. She wonders how her hair looks, even as she pries Nabila's finger away from the girl's mouth. Nabila's gaze could have smoked the man should he be looking, but he is not. He continues to fiddle with his camera. Madam Jamila takes the opportunity to glance at her children sitting behind her to make sure for what seemed like that, what seemed like the hundredth time that day, that they are at least not wearing those old t-shirts with faded prints and holes in them. 
which they usually wear around the house. She is re relieved to find that they are all wearing their casual going out clothes, the buy and bulk t-shirts and shorts from night bazaars. The, re the reporter is looking at the things around the room. Madam Jamila thinks the wall can use some decoration, so plain and faded green. The furnishing is scant and the old fat television is sitting on an old stool. Madam Jamila wonders if it is high time she sets aside money to get some things for the living room, maybe a matching chair and coffee table that, that is not too expensive. So at least the living room will look like one and visitors will not have to sit on the floor. She tries to be polite and cheerful in the face of all this. That's how they are going to portray her in the newspapers, how cheerful she is despite practically being a single mother with kids to feed in the face of the economic downturn. Madame Jamila starts to speak of the upcoming PSLE exams and how stressful it has become for students nowadays. The reporter agrees. While speaking, Madam Jamila worries about how the house will appear in the picture. She gives the living room a quick inspection. At least the floor has been mopped. The laundry, which earlier has been in a pile on a plastic chair by the window, is now folded and put away. She got the boys to help her wipe the window panes and put up the newly washed curtain. So no matter how sparse the room will look like in the picture, she can be content that it is clean. Nabila chews on her finger again. The eldest two of her children still staring at the photographer, while the fourth and the fifth has engaged themselves in a noisy game of a gypsum wood, trying to see who can last the longest, not squealing when pinched hard on the back of a hand. Madam Jamila starts for Nabila's hand when the photographer finally speaks. Okay, ready. Now you all just look natural. Azman, the responsible eldest, turns his head to the television. Ashira, the second child, the eldest of the girls, sits hunched on a plastic stool with her back to the cameraman. She tucks the bottom of her t-shirt over the band of her shorts, suddenly afraid that she might expose something when the picture is taken. It is a pity that Hidayah is not home for her supplementary class yet. She will be sorry to have missed a chance to be in the newspapers. She always loves attention. So Riani and Fredaus stop playing their game of Anjutsumot and giggling like the little girl and boy that they are, turn from where they sit cross-legged on the floor to look at the television. Nabila removes her finger from her mouth of her own accord and slumps further back into her mother's body, continuing to stare at the camera with the fearlessness of a child who does not know what she faces. Madam Jamila wraps her arms around Nabila and smiles at the camera, watching the lens as she prepares for the shot to come. Her heart, her heart beats fast and the corners of her lips quiver. The photographer lifts the viewfinder to his eye and says, okay, ah? before counting to three. Three, just as the flesh comes, Madam Jamila turns her eyes away. That's the end of my reading. Thank you. And next we'll have Rico. Take it away, Rico. Hello all, it's uh, nice to see you virtually. Uh, I'm Rico Siosoko. Uh, I'm coming to you from <clears throat> San Francisco in my living room and I am wearing a black shirt uh, and it's very warm here in San Francisco. <laughs> um, I wanted to say before I get going, uh, thank you to G and to Inez for moderating. Um, all the folks of Singapore Literature Festival, I can uh, see Neuralia uh, nodding in agreement. And I'm especially pleased to jo join Neuralia. I think one of the things that's great, if there is anything great about the pandemic, is 
the cross-cultural and intercultural connections we can make. So here I am in San Francisco, California, and Neuralia is in Singapore. So <clears throat> thank you all for being here. I'm going to read uh, from my collection of short stories. It's called uh, The Foley Artist. And the story I'm going to read is um, the first story in the collection. It's called uh, The Rice Bowl. Viva wants her boobs back. Viva, real name Victor, is seated on the zebra, sin, zebra skin toilet cover, whining in a high falsetto at Barbarella, a linebacker of a drag queen. Viva says, Barbie, give me that bra. Barbie, you ain't got no right. Barbie, you best watch your ass or I'll sick GI Joe on it. Barbie, a nickname that Barbarella, real name Barry hates, applies her peach perfection eyeliner in the mirror and says, stop flapping them gums, honey, I'm catching cold. Viva's homemade thunder bra is really an old t-shirt that she has carefully, artfully sewn into the perky C cups of a wonder bra. Barbarella has borrowed them for the third time this week, strapped them over her wide hairy chest beneath her black kimono. In Des Moines, there's only one decent lingerie store for a respectable queen to patronize. Victoria's Secret on the second level of Jordan Creek Mall, and it's all the way on the west side of town in the Tony suburbs, formerly Oatfields, 11.5 miles from the Rice Bowl. And neither Viva nor Barbarella, divas who gleam like windows after a rain, owns a car. Everyone in Des Moines knows the Rice Bowl, how four star our food is, our location on the south side, just outside the wrought iron gates of the fairgrounds, and most important, and here I speak with affection, the kind of girls who work here. Viva once said to a curious reviewer from the Des Moines Register, baby, don't you know a glamour puss when you see one? Barbarella leaned on her shoulder and added, we're just a couple of Twinkies, yellow on the outside, white and dreamy on the inside. The reviewer ate his cashew chicken as sweat formed under his armpits. Barbarella is Filipino, Viva, Chinese like me. I'm not a drag queen, I'm just gay. When I ask the girls to do something, wipe down the booths or set a table for a party of six, they give me a hard time, call me double happiness, my real name is David, or something they think is equally sassy. But taking shit from the two of them doesn't bother me, it's part of the manager's job. My father, Louis Chen, opened the rice bowl in the winter of 1969 after he had immigrated to the States with his wife. Mom had accepted a fellowship in civil engineering at Iowa State. And sometimes dad, in his I am funny immigrant mode, jokes with the regulars that I was a gift from the university. He and mom were always kidding around like that before she split with a physics professor and moved to Southern California. Even without her, the rice bowl is thriving. As I see it, there are three reasons for our success. Number one, we don't pretend to be something we're not. Number two, we've got the best damn stiff spare ribs in town, the kind that melts off the little finger bones when you bite into them. Unlike the radioactive things, the other Mr. Chen serves at China Palace a few blocks down on East 14th Street. But most important, number three, Viva and Barbarella, our only waitresses, they prefer to be called entertainers, are a big draw. The register reviewer compared them to beauty queens, except Viva's hips are more slender, he wrote, and Barbarella looks like she has hockey pads for shoulders. Des Moines is a little backwards, but not as unwelcoming for a gay person as you might think. I mean, there is one gay bar, The Garden. That's where I met my boyfriend, Howard, a lanky, somewhat bookish, mealy-haired teacher at West Des Moines High School. Viva calls Howard the, the king of square, but his nerdiness and his endless chattering about quantum things and mechanics, he teaches algebra two and geometry are exactly what I find attractive. When he bought me a drink that first night when I was celebrating my 25th birthday, it was his black horn-rimmed horn glasses that caught my eye, his scraggly unshaven jaw. Even now, I love the way he cocks his head when he's puzzled, like a dog. Too bad he's lived here his whole life and is ready to call this city quits. Des Moines definitely has its quirks. This obsession with skywalks, Viva calls them big glass penises, countless shopping malls, 
two lane Bryants for every house, fat housewife in the city and endless ribbons of farmland on which lately 18 hold golf courses and miles of gated communities have begun to appear. Howard's school was built a couple of years ago up past the airport on a plowed over field that once harvested soybeans and corn instead of hormonal teens. Sprawl is taking over America, he proclaimed to Viva the other day. Des Moines is doomed. His green eyes glinted maniacally and his hands curled into talons. Viva puckered up and gave him her tra trademark figure Z snap before sashaying into the kitchen. She thinks if Howard wasn't a teacher, he'd be writing conspiracy theories in some carbon copied newsletter. But Viva has demented visions of her own. Viva's delusions have to do with the endless blight on August called the Iowa State Fair. It's the largest of its kind in the Midwest and people buy the, drive their boxy mobile homes hundreds of miles to see god awful attractions like Elsie the Cow, a 600 pound butter sculpture with an udder that squirts milk. To top it all off over Labor Day weekend, live on the come and go main stage, there's entertainment by every smiling swing choir in the state. Now that by golly is entertainment. Viva wants the three of us to enter the talent show this year. The cash prize is $1,000 and lip sync Diana Ross's all time greatest hit, I'm Coming Out. I think it's a bad idea and tell her so. Viva, however, has stars in her eyes one morning while setting tables, she unveils her name for our singing trio, Asian Slaw. Barbarella loses it, her blue page boy tilting on her head. Howard and the regulars think the girls are a crack up. One Friday morning near the beginning of June, Mr. Henry asks Barbarella out on a date. Old Mr. Henry, a retired librarian, was my father's first customer when he and mom opened the rice bowl decades ago. Every day he appears in our doorway beneath dad's eight-sided mirror, dressed in these bright suspenders that clash with his purple fedora. Once he asked dad if he had any candles lying around to celebrate his 20 years of collecting social security. The old guy is all right, though he calls whoever waits on him, including me, girly. Maybe he got the habit from dad who sometimes sits with him and reads the Chinese newspaper. Mr. Henry eats his lunch at 10.30 each morning at the round six top next to the swinging kitchen doors. And he calls out to whoever's nearby, girly, you're keeping an old man waiting. He orders the same lunch special, number 36, egg drop soup, egg foo young with pork, and on the side, no ice, iced tea. He likes Barbarella the best. Her tips from the old geezer are twice as much as Viva's or mine. So when Mr. Henry asks her out, the crazy Filipino girl says, yes. Viva whispers to me, where the hell are they gonna go? Foul lanes for a couple games of rock and bowl? Later, I close the door to the little girl's room while Barbarella is changing into a crushed velvet number that clings to her huge frame like a wetsuit. That old geezer really thinks you're a girl, I say. He'd knock you silly if he knew you played football at East High but she won't listen. She just, she just keeps penciling in her eyebrows and powdering the blotchy temples above her eyes. Doesn't matter if he thinks I'm the queen of Sheba, she says. He asked and I'm going. I pinch her arm and let the bathroom door latch. The next morning after their date, her round made up face is glowing, her nails done in a bright shade of purple with silver glittering stars. She tells us that she and Mr. Henry are going to run off together to some remote island in the Caribbean. We're in love, she says, refilling small hourglass bottles with soy sauce. He's my rumpled old prince. Viva plops in the booth opposite Barbarella and scowls, tearing the wrapper off a pair of wooden chopsticks. Barbie, you're a fool, she says. You gonna give that old geezer an angina. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rico and Ralia. What a treat to hear you guys read and to hear um, 
the author's own voices. I think there's a lot we get when we see the face of the person who wrote it reading it and um, such a treat to hear from both of you. Um, to everyone in the audience, now is the time. If you have any writers, uh, questions for our two authors, please put them in the chat and I will get ready to ask them. Uh, but I'll kick us off. I'd like to ask both of you a question. And that would be, firstly, what does the word political mean to you, given that we're discussing the political possibilities of the short story? Um, oh, okay. <laughs> uh, I think um, political for me, you know, especially when thinking of it in the context of art and art making, um, it means relating to and unpacking you know, the structures and, and systems okay, that we are, that are at work you know, in our society. So, you know, structures would be, you know, how societies organize systems would be how things are being managed, how things are being moved. Um, yeah. And, and basically managed, moved and controlled uh, within within a particular society or a country. So, and so, and when it comes to, to art making and when it comes to thinking politically, um, when it comes to being political, what it means to me is also to kind of like situate yourself um, within those structures and systems um, and, and the people and to, and while you're situating yourself, it's also situating the people who look like you, who, who think like you, who, sounds like you, um, who lives like you, and how they and how they actually fit, or more often than not, don't fit into, mm -hmm. into the, the structures and those, those very structures and systems. So I think polit being political, you know, political also means an examination and critique mm -hmm. uh, of those of the systems. Yeah. So, I love that. Uh, pardon? Oh, I love that. Um, and yeah. that dual sense of um, to see structures is also to critique, right? To say, this is what I see going on. And um, right. without just sort of stating that, but to put you know your own perspective on it. Um, something I found really striking in your story was, um, and both of you actually, the sense of um, perspective, whether if you're an insider within a certain group or an outsider, how you might appear to others, how concerned you are about the way you appear to others. Um, something I kind of heard happening in all your stories. Um, Rico, how about you? What does political mean to you? <laughs> thanks, thanks, Anna. <laughs> um, I love what Norelli was saying about um, structures and systems. I definitely uh, agree wholeheartedly. Um, <clears throat> I mean, to that I would add power. And uh, I think about who is um, in the margins and who's in the mainstream. I think that's uh, essential to think about. Um, and you know, uh, I love I love the title of this panel and, and some of the prompts you gave us, Inez. Um, some of the things I think about are, are very simple, basic things like like the personal is political. So um, my some of my characters in my fiction are are living their lives, and because they are um, so open with their identities, I think those mm -hmm. can be political acts. Um, mm -hmm. I, have, I have a ton of thoughts on political, so I just want to <laughs> like. We'll just, we'll just dip in a little bit at a time. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Oh. And um, to add to that, um, I remember the first time I heard the phrase, the personal is political, it absolutely blew my mind. Um, I think it was a college professor who was trying to convince us and succeeded in convincing us that Pride and Prejudice was an enormously political novel. And you think at first, like, how on earth? And then you think, okay, marriage is an institution. It's connected to wealth. Wealth is connected to power. Suddenly the idea of who marries who and who runs off with who and who, you know, is fitting in and not fitting in um, becomes enormously political. And um, that can be a very light touch, right? And I think as we see um, in both your stories, um, identity itself, so political um, and, and just um, people being who they are in front of other people can be a political act. If we could just turn to those stories for just a moment, um, could you tell us to you, um, is there anything that feels political about that story you read or was there something political about the way you went about writing it? Okay. 
Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so I think for because the story that I wrote it features the um part one which I did not write I did not read um is from the perspective of how um this woman um life a woman who is living in a state of poverty and um and the thing is that sometimes and this is in in Singapore sometimes among like social circle social work the circles of social work or uh, especially in the context of discussing um you know when certain organizations or uh, people who who are in spaces of say privilege when they talk about the um, people from low income is the the insinuation and the implication mm -hmm. is always like you know they made bad choices mm -hmm. um why were they um why when you know you are in such situations why do you have five or seven children um and so on and the thing is that um, having grown up in such a situation myself, and also having relatives and people that I'm close to who, who you know, who lives in such a situation, having worked in, you know, a self-help group organization before, um, what has been told to these women sometimes it's a very, uh, how do you say? It's akin to, you know, like a, a forced sterilization. It's just like perhaps um, to help you with your situation, you should go through um, one of the, the sterilization, uh, you know, pro uh, procedures. So um, anyway, that is uh, neither, um, yeah. This is just a little bit of like context when it comes to the situation here uh, in Singapore. It may look like things are going nice and well, but we are telling women from low-income uh, families and situations to go like, maybe you should tie or, or cut your, your tube. Mm -hmm. so, so anyway, mm -hmm. so, yeah. And um, the way when I was, so that is one of the things, um, that's the context. Mm -hmm. And when I was writing the piece, and later on when I was reflecting on it, we, in Singapore, part of the state apparatus is actually the media. And the mainstream media is a, a part of the state apparatus. Um, and so, like a lot of, let's say, knowledge of people, group, um, you know, people of groups and communities, is kind of like being framed and siphoned by, by what, you know, mainstream media presents. I know things are Hopefully things are getting better from 2010. Um, there's a lot more alternative sources of, of news that is coming up, especially with like the digital age really like blowing up and giving giving people some sense of you know um, economy with regards to how information and what kind of information is mm -hmm. so yeah, so I think what is political about my work is really mm. um, kind of like showing the behind the scenes. Mm. Uh, what's going on, you know, giving the, the community that is often presented. And the thing is that uh, when we present, um, you know, families in difficult situations, it is not them who is the main audience. Mm. The, it is like everyone else. Mm -hmm. and, and then it, it kind of, it does play into certain biases and prejudices. Mm -hmm. So, I'm sure. so with my story, what happens is that here's a woman who is, um, there's a certain sense of autonomy and dignity that's been given to her, where she, it shows her, you know, um, the back, the, you know, shows her as a person who cares about how the house looks. Mm -hmm. When I was growing up, you know, um, I grew up in a, in a very poor family. My mom's concern is like the house needs to look presentable mm -hmm. because, you know, your people are going to judge you based on your house. So no matter how poor you are, your house needs to be clean. So, yeah, and that is that is power. And like mm -hmm. uh, Rico mentioned, right? Power is mm -hmm. a big political. It's also about power, and sometimes it's about putting power into the hands of those who do not have it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So in this case, this is you know <laughs> making the house look nice, making it neat, and making sure the children are well dressed. <laughs> um, this, are, this is 
these are powerful um, mm. these are powerful things and, and speaking of power rico what was political about the rice bowl and the writing of yeah. it yeah I, I mean i would i would build off of what nerali was saying I, I i feel like who we spotlight and and i was really mm -hmm. interested in nerali's work where there's an emphasis on class um mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. that part where you were talking about the mother and the images I related to because uh, I think about my family and class um, mm -hmm. when they were in the Philippines, they came from um, an upper class. And then when they immigrated to the US, which is, is it's very autobiographical, some of the details in my fiction, they immigrated to the Midwest where they were poor. So it was, you know, this tr transcending class that that kind of interests me. Um, mm -hmm. In my in my writing, I think one of the the political acts I've made are, are to focus and center all of uh, my stories on characters who happen to be Filipino American. Um, I don't usually visualize white folks. They're like the supporting characters in my stories. And um, I intentionally, I, sometimes I talk about this, uh, I intentionally center um, a Filipino American reader. And to me, that's mm -hmm. pretty radical. Like, mm -hmm. uh, I think when I was younger, before I, I, I went to grad school, I would imagine my reader probably unconsciously as being a white reader. And for me to say, I don't have to explain every word in Tagalog. Um, G and I had this conversation oftentimes and, and Kimberly, because uh, they're, they're the ones who publish my book. You know, I was like, I don't think we need to translate every Tagalog word, you know, because my readers are, are like me, they're like Filipino Americans. So I love um, conversations like that and centering mm -hmm. um, Filipino Americans. Um, I mean, sometimes I, I ask my students to do the same thing. Like, mm -hmm. let's just imagine for a day you go out the world and think in a non-heteronormative way. Like, what if you imagine everybody is gay so they came out to you as straight? Like, what would, how would that shift your thinking? And so I like, to, I like to kind of play around with that a little bit. I love that you said reimagining, Rico. Um, both of you do that in a lot of different ways in your fiction, whether thought experiments like that, um, speculative elements, um, just trying to see the world in a different way, especially if we've been accustomed or um, you know, led to see it in certain ways. Um, that'll take us nicely to our first question from Christopher. Um, and I'm gonna kind of broaden it for both of you. Um, he says to Neuralia, uh, I love your reading. It seems like it was a very slow motion analysis of a real photograph. Was this writing based on a real photograph you saw or was it based on a real life encounter in your research? And I think I'll throw that to both of you. Um, in your stories, was that a real life encounter? Um, especially, right, um, thinking of, of political subjects and um, being concerned of telling stories. Um, maybe Neuralia first, followed by Rico. To answer the, the question that was posted is whether it was um, based on a real photograph. Mm -hmm. It's actually based on a series of real photographs. Like mm -hmm. over the years, if we were to open the, our, our state, um, our good news Bible uh, in Singapore, <laughs> it's called the Straits Times. And then if you were to open it, the pages, sometimes it would feature like, um, lives of real people. I mean, kudos mm -hmm. to them for wanting to, to give the space to show some mm -hmm. friends that look, you know, um, uh, they, they are members of the community that is not very privileged, for example. But then a bunch of photographs that I see always tend to have like the whole family um, shown. If it's going to be a, a poor family, it's very likely, it's very stark that it will be shown in, that they will be photographed in their flat um, usually there'll be scant furniture or the, the homes will not be, you know, your beautiful Scandinavian um, a modern decor, but it's run down, it's um, lifting. And yeah, sometimes it'll be cramped. Sometimes it's just a single room. So that's, so it's based on a series of, of photographs and I'm kind of just like concentrating it into, into the story. Um, the real life encounters, so far I have not, yeah, um, mm -hmm. when it comes to real life encounters, no, I haven't been to or been part of such uh, photography before, mm -hmm. um, but definitely just open up to it. Um, 
So yeah, that is. Yeah. And what was the other question that you asked in that? I'm so sorry. Uh, that was broadly it, um, inspired by real life events. Christopher, very kind things to say about that story. Um, Rico, how about you with that particular story? Yeah, I, there, there's no uh, restaurant with drag queens, or, or <laughs> Asian drag queens. Um, there was a place in New York called Lucky Chang's for those of us who are in their 50s like me, it closed down. <laughs> she is nodding. I used to go to Lucky Chang's and it was Asian drag queens. And I think it was in the Lower East Side before it closed. So, you know, where these ideas come from, I, I would be curious, you know, Neuralia, mm -hmm. I, I remember thinking, this is the craziest thing I've ever seen, like all of these Asian drag queens. And what if they were in the Midwest? Like literally <laughs> that's the whole story. And so that's the way it played out. <laughs> Um, on to our next question. Thanks from Shu Si. Uh, loved both your readings. Curious to know what both authors think about the contemporary American short story. And if it's okay, I'm going to broaden this to contemporary American or contemporary Singaporean. Um, and she wants to know, uh, is it political in the way both your stories are? Mm. Big question. Um, <laughs> feel free to mention maybe one or two if the uh, American short story or Singaporean short story is very large. I would. Can I, can I jump in around? Yeah, please. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'm still yeah, thinking. I, I mean, one of the things that comes up for me immediately is um, because I, I went to grad school here in the States um, that all of my authors were really white men. <laughs> like, you know, I, I read Hemingway, Cheever. I read all the greats. I read some women. I read Alice Munro. And, and they're really influential for me. Like, that's where you learn your craft, um, you know. We all, we all did the Raymond Carver short story, right? But I had to make intentional efforts to both seek out um, faculty of color in my graduate program. I think mm -hmm. there was maybe one, this is a long time ago, but I don't, I don't think there was even one. And um, I had to say, I wanna read these Filipino writers. Like mm -hmm. I had to fight to get those on my reading list. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, I don't, I don't know if that was the question, but I was, Hmm. Sure. The, so saying that at least there's a canon in place that takes a certain amount of momentum to, to maybe shift against at this yeah. point in time. Yeah, and that was the 90s. I think it's a very different canon now. You know, mm -hmm. it's so exciting right now for at least, at least Asian American literature. Mm -hmm. uh, and Nor I'm not familiar with Singaporean. Noralia, how about you? Do you feel that the short story in Singapore is political? I think so. I think, um, <laughs> to be honest, I think in I don't know if, I think it applies um, in other countries too, that sometimes to write, to, to write, even if the story is very speculative, um, to write is a very political act, mm -hmm. particularly in Singapore, mm -hmm. where, you know, writing can sometimes be dangerous. Yeah, there's some of the, the laws that, that we have. Uh, so yeah, probably gonna lose my job after this. I, <laughs> so, um, no, I'm kidding. So uh, the thing is that with Singaporean, you know, just to, uh, even in school, I, um, the canon was actually very white men as mm. well, <laughs> in, even in Singapore. Mm. Um, though I can't really remember because then after that, I, I did actively seek out like Singaporean mm. short stories and so on. So mm. I think overall, um, Singaporean short stories have now really expanded um beyond because i think there was a period of time where the singapore short story was very i think overtly political because it does talk about certain aspects of the human condition of being in singapore um existentialism isolation and the problems with the structure so i, I think yeah now it has um now it is still doing that but I think it has really, it's very exciting to see the way it broadens because we do have um, short stories written, you know, speculative fiction written as short stories. Um, we do see experimentation um, mm -hmm. and so on. So I think I would say, I would say that a lot, most of the Singaporean short stories are political because um, there will be of aspects of the Singaporean mm -hmm. society, of um, the systems, the cultures, the, the structures. And a lot of the short stories do focus, let's say spotlight certain groups or mm -hmm. they, 
they kind of work to dismantle um, some of the system. Sometimes they, you know, it's a very exciting uh, critiques, yeah, uh, and, and so on. So yeah, I would say, um, I would say that Singaporean short stories are, are very political. And kind of, and piggybacking yeah. off that, since both of you uh, were answering, uh, we have a question about what do both of you hope to achieve politically with your short stories? And maybe we can broaden this a little bit. Um, both of you are educators, you're activists. Um, I'm hearing lots of really juicy verbs, like dismantle <laughs> and so on. Um, but do you, do you consciously go in with um, political aims or goals? Or is, are you focused more on the story that you're telling? I think for me, the, the first thing is always the story. Mm -hmm. um, actually, I went through a phase where I'm just like, no, I am not political. Never, I shall be that writer. Right? You know, if they look like me, you can't. Um, I think, no, I think when I first go into the story, definitely I have a, a character, a person in mind, and then that person's story, without, without thinking like, oh, no, I'm going to write this and just make the, the fit. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, no, I think the focus is the story. And I think that in itself can be a political act. Mm -hmm. Just not on, say, big picture, uh, big picture things like, um, mm -hmm. Economy and, um, <laughs> and what else is the picture here? All right. I once heard you say in an interview that the, when you tried to think too consciously about what a story was about, it almost didn't get written. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> right. And so it if sounds like. Think, oh, oh yeah, uh, yeah. If I were to think too much about, about it, about what it means and so on, then it's almost like a paralysis. So the focus is always on the character mm -hmm. and the story that you want to tell. And trusting that what you're getting across comes across, right? If you're just paying careful attention to this character and the slow look at them and their situation, as Christopher was pointing out. How about you, Rico? Yeah, I, I think that similar to Neuralia, the stories come to me or they come to us. And so, you know, they're driven by a character. And, and that's just fiction, you know, it's, it's not, unless you're writing explicitly like a political uh, treatise. Um, but with characters, they're speaking to us. I think mm -hmm. like, for example, the Rice Bowl was written when I was a younger person and mm -hmm. I was less political then. So the characters mm -hmm. that I choose to spotlight are just mm -hmm. the people that were less political. And I think about huh. my writing now and the characters that I'm, I'm interested in like one of the characters uh, I'm working on a novel, she is a young activist. So, you mm -hmm. know, as our, as, as writers, we develop politically, I think our interests and our characters change. Um, yeah, it, it, it's, it's a little bit, I don't know if, if you have this experience, Norelia, sometimes when I'm reading older work, I'm just like, oh man, this is not me now. You know, it's been out in the world and you give your fiction to the world and then they're going to do what they, what they want with it. But you know, I'm, I'm working on something different. So it's like our, our political understanding and our political consciousness, um, it evolved. Mm -hmm. I like that word evolving. I mean, it's almost as if, um, I mean, we have different times in our life, right? You have your blue period. You have your kind of like, I'm gonna write about activist period. Um, I just wanted to connect that to one more question that was like getting a lot of like snaps in the chat. Um, but someone was asking, Aruni asking kind of about, um, speaking of the contemporary short story and its political possibilities, um, wondering if that might be in tension with, um, as he put it, the fetishization of craft or if there's times when you know we're so focused on something in the story that we're um, we're you know we're losing some of the political possibilities, does that ever feel like those things are intention for you, or happens in stories that you read? Rico's nodding. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I think about some of the 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 politics and the forces, things like colonialism, imperialism. They affect my characters, and I'm very mindful. Mm -hmm. of that. So I have a story that I was interested in two women. One was Filipina and one is Filipino American. And mm -hmm. what I was really interested in is where they don't connect, where mm -hmm. you would think from the outside, like the, the mainstream white gays would be like, oh, they're exactly the same. Well, they're very different. And the reason they're there is because of 
American imperialism and Western medicine and, and you know, all of us who are Filipino know the, the prol proliferation of Filipino nurses. So she has a very specific reason for being in Boston. So it's kind of like me as a writer, I understand my history, but when you try and write it like that, it, it becomes like, at least for me, it's like, oh, that, that character is ranting about politics. Like, it's not, it's not, there's no like emotion or like, mm. it's, yeah, mm -hmm. challenge. Hmm. So as long as you're not losing sight of the story, it sounds like. Yeah, it's 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 usually in the background for me of, mm -hmm. of the characters and the forces that that, that have acted upon them to mm -hmm. where their mm -hmm. position is or the, or wherever they're at in their lives. Um, mm -hmm. But I try not to make it explicitly political. Hmm. Norelli, how about you? Um, yeah, it's a big question. Yes, it is a big question. You can tell from my face, I'm thinking very, very hard. So I think um, similar with, similarly with, with Rico, right, the political is always in the back because you are mm. aware of certain things. Right? So you, you do not go about going like, okay, I want to be explicit about this. But um, for me, I do discover that a lot of my, of my short story uh, a lot of my short stories are responsive or the ones that, I mean, the ones that are out in the world, um, the ones that are out in the world, it depends. But I think when most of the time when I'm writing, let's say a piece of short fiction, it is usually a response to, to something I've seen, something I've encountered, mm -hmm. question that I have about, mm -hmm. about um, certain topics or issues. Or uh, not that questions that I have, but questions that were presented to me. Because one of the short stories that I wrote was to, to was a way for me to think about and respond to what is it like in mm -hmm. if Singapore was never colonized. So I had to like go into a thought experiment. So it's always in the background. Mm -hmm. um, the focus is is on the craft because I think mm -hmm. that is the way in which the story is to be delivered. Um, and yeah, so, and so the focus would have to be that. And of course you need to, to focus on the character. Yeah, and, and because that uh, they are the ones that carry the story mm -hmm. um, and they are the ones that we just would relate to. Mm -hmm. right? And then like, like Rico, the, the, politic, the political is always in the background. And mm -hmm. I think it, it kind of like seeps into your fingers when you write, it's just <laughs> there. Yeah? It's just part of the air. Yeah, I love that. I love like thinking of it going through your fingertips. Let's all do this and <laughs> as we think about it. Um, yeah. As we're kind of wrapping up here, there were so many good questions that we didn't have time for. Um, but um, I love that last answer from both of you because um, you know I was thinking about the word political. You know, it means it comes from polis, just meaning the city, the citizenry. It goes back to people. As long as people are involved. Um, something is political by its very nature. And so hearing you think about those characters, right, the human beings in your stories and wanting to understand how they think and feel and go about in the world um, seems like a really nice ending point. Uh, but in, in our last maybe like half a second each, um, you know, this festival this year, the theme is the politics of hope. And I was wondering if you could say what hope has to do with your writing. <laughs> In 30 seconds. In 30 <laughs> seconds. Oh, no. I mean, um, I think about, yeah. oh, sorry, I, I think about what I say to, to my students because, you know, they're learning, sometimes I'll teach like an ethnic studies course and they're learning about the institution of slavery and oppression uh, of genocide of Native Americans. So it's like, how do you have any hope? And you have to talk to them about the politics of hope. You have to say, hmm. you know, MLK is saying about the, arc of moral justice is long, but it bends towards justice. So mm -hmm. any any good activist is going to have some hope and practice a politics of hope. Um, mm -hmm. so I think it's really important. Aurelia? So um, I was just thinking of, because I, in the school that I thought, we just concluded the documentary write, script writing module. And the students were, were taught to, to think about, because um, they were taught to think about, about hope when it comes to ending their documentary. Hmm. So in their documentaries, you show a particular reality, then how do you end on a hopeful note, hmm. right? So, um, yeah, so I was just thinking of that. And I think for me, when it comes to, to hope, it's a matter of um, 
uh, personally as a writer is what I hope people are able to, to get from the short stories mm-hmm. and what mm-hmm. they, they take away with it. Mm-hmm. So if they're able to see the characters, they're able to see a different reality, that is the hope that I have um, for them. Yeah. When it comes to so my work. Hope when we play. <laughs> And on that note, thank you both so much. I'll be turning us back over to G to wrap us up. You're on mute, G. G, uh, G you're on mute. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I was just uh, thanking Ines all right, for her fine moderation of this uh, uh, discussion, you know, how wide ranging it is, you know, it touches on so many different topics. Uh, so thank you so much, Ines, for doing that for us. And of course, thank you to our speakers uh, uh, tonight, Nurali as uh, Rico, for actually sharing uh, uh, with us your politics and, and uh, your craft. I mean, I think what makes your story so compelling is that the politics is not divorced from the craft, right? You know, it is possible to fetishize it. It's possible to actually disconnect it and make the craft to the be all and end all. Yeah, but you don't, right? You don't. Uh, and I love that image, really, of your politics coming through your fingers because you can't help it, right? <laughs> you think you're concentrating on story and character, but you really you're writing very politically because it just comes through the person that you are. So I'm um, so glad that we are able to see you in person <laughs> and hear you in person because the personal is political. All right, as in essays. Thank you. And so um, everyone, uh, I want to thank you so much uh, to big thank you to all of you for joining us uh, tonight. Uh, do check out the books by our authors. <laughs> the links are actually given in chat right now. All right. And uh, we hope you've enjoyed this uh, event uh, brought to you by Singapore Unbound. The next event actually begins in uh, 30 minutes and the Zoom link is given in chat. Novelist uh, Amanda Lee Ko and poet Paula Mendoza will discuss what or whom they celebrate in their work. Tomorrow is the last day of the festival, so please join us to hear novelist Mira Chan and Amy Liu speak about revolutionary family histories and to hear scholar and activist Jackie Wang give the closing address on the future of abolition. Now, if you like what Singapore Unbound is doing for cultural exchange, freedom of expression and equal rights, please consider making a generous donation at Fractured Atlas, our fiscal sponsor. We rely on individual champions like you to do the work that we do. Thanks again, everyone, for joining us tonight. We love having you. Please join us tomorrow. All the events are just after this, but we will say goodbye and good night for now. Bye. <laughs>